requesting to read. Oh, thanks for the reminder. We are recording and we are sharing this out on Facebook. So if folks would like to be anonymous or have privacy, this can be um, a moment for you to have your videos off if you feel so comfortable to do that. And so our nunnicks are, um, this one is made from soapstone and it was, uh, a traditional role uh, for young um, girls and other people in the community to tend to the light. And so we really wanted to utilize this theme for this moment in time as we're transitioning to, you know, the darkest parts of winter where it's getting colder and really, re you know, celebrating together in that we've made it through another difficult year. I think being in the second year of a pandemic has been very stressful and isolating and, you know, a, a collective trauma. And so, you know, as we're coming to the close of this year, we're really turning towards the light in the ways that we still are able to come in together as community in the ways that we really support the values that are important to us and the ways in which we are, really worth investing in, you know, our values and our principles and the ways in which we engage in community and want to shift economy and shift the standards of the world that we find ourselves is really um, kind of the spirit that we're fundraising today. And so we do appreciate everyone who has participated in our grassroots fundraising, fundraising effort and really just value that it's, every dollar counts and with Native movements um, positioning with fundraising, I think Native movement really values the importance of um, on the ground, grassroots, on the front lines, community members that are really working to have positive change in their communities across the state. And that's why we really believe in re-granting. And so this donor briefing will really highlight the wonderful fiscally sponsored organizations that we partner with and that we're so proud to be in community with. And so um, we are just taking a moment. Um, I think it's just been really beautiful for myself personally to reconnect with the Kulik, um, with the Nanak. My grandparents uh, have transitioned. My last grandmother has passed on. She passed away this spring. And so the Kulik is a way for me to kind of ground myself in my connection with my ancestors and my traditions that I may not have had that physical connection right now. Um, I'm, re I'm relearning what that connection can look like in the ways that we uh, as Indigenous people are able to relearn and rebuild connection. And it also is an invitation for our non-Native community members to share in, in the ways that they also connect with their ancestors, with their practices, with their ideas of spirituality and in the ways in which we want to have hope and connection in a world and even in a time where it, it, you know it is cold and dark and this has been um, across communities there's this festival of lights and today is the third day of Hanukkah and there's definitely um, many ways that you know people across the world celebrate light in, in times of darkness. And we really appreciate that also as a metaphor for the type of work that Native movement participates in and the ways that our community members also by donating share in that work um, because sometimes it can be so hard to know um, where to support and how to you know, share with the community and, and support different movements, but Native movement certainly tries to um, be a link in, in supporting uh, various efforts across the state and, and really increase accessibility to funds and be able just to support people on the ground and, and in our state. And so just 
like to take a moment um, to just admire the Kulik. Um, right now I am using olive oil, <laughs> but normally um, or traditionally we would use seal oil, but being now an urban native, it's um, <laughs> a very precious resource. So I'm using olive oil, but um, many folk can use Wesson oil or coconut or sesame if you really wanted it fragrant. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it's just been a wonderful journey to be able to to make it and to light it and to see the ways that it's um, something that's just been around really for generate, I mean, time memorial, um, we would have always needed light and we still do. And now it can be something that's a way to practice ceremony in everyday life, as well as the function of it too. And so we're just, coming up um, for just about at 1210. And so I would love to introduce Akpik Apuk with Native Movement. She's our acting, edu um, sorry, our acting <laughs> executive director and she will be sharing more about Native Movement and the ways that we're in community. Thank you so much, Inurak, for lighting the Kuluk. It means a lot to me. And I have one, but I'm still learning how to keep it lit. It's a real skill, everyone. If you haven't done that before, it actually takes quite a bit of practice to learn to light it. So I really appreciate you, Inurak, for, for bringing that um, to this space. So good afternoon, Uvanga Charlene Apak Nupak Siska Akpik, Chinik Mugurunga, Sulina Chervik Mugurunga, Savaktunga Native Movement. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Charlene Apak and my Nupak name is Akpik. My family is from Gullivan in White Mountain, Alaska, but I reside on Denina territories here in Anchorage. And thank you so much for spending this time with us and joining us today for this. Um, event and yes happy hanukkah to folks out there as well and i love that we're celebrating the light and warmth together um i'm really really proud to be here today i'm just going to try to share a few few remarks but then i really want to give more space to our fiscally sponsored partners who we've invited and i'm really excited um, for you all to hear about their work um but i'm really really proud to be a part of native movement i'm usually the gender justice and healing director. And while our fearless leader Ine is out, um, I'm helping support our team uh, while she takes some much needed rest. So really happy to be here. We have some amazing programs at Native Movement, but today we really want to take the opportunity to uplift and highlight our other movement builders in our communities who are doing such important work. Um, we have fiscally sponsored structure at Native Movement that really helps provide the administrative and fiscal support for some of our smaller orgs who are really just getting going, um, but doing such important work in their communities. And I love this about Native Movement that we have had um, a long history of fiscal sponsorship that provides that administrative support um, for our communities who are doing this. So we've been doing regranting and this kind of um, structure for a long time, and it really provides that accessibility um, for our communities, because as we know, with small groups and grassroots organizing, there can be a lot of um, moving pieces, and we want to really support folks and just what they're doing without um, and making it easy for them to do that work as much as possible. Um, so really, really happy to be here and um, uplift those on the front lines and so that you all can see all of the amazing work that's happening across the state. Um, the other, you know, the other part of this is really that I want to emphasize is that this is Indigenous values and ways of being that this is us having reciprocity. We don't just like fundraise and take it all right like we re gift and we we give back and we know that in our Indigenous values. Um, you know, wealth isn't how much we can take and how much we can hoard, it's how much we can give. And that's why we're here today. And I'm really, really excited to share about some of the work that Native Movement supports um, and that 
really to frame this in indigenous values of reciprocity um, that we that we really practice in our organization. And again, I'm really honored to to be here and to um, invite the other uh, groups to share about their work. And I think I'm going to be handing it off to Jessica Gerard at FCAC first, um, and then we'll go through the rest of the groups. And I don't know if maybe I'm supposed to say this, but so we'll hear from FCAC first, um, and then we'll hear from the herring protectors. And then we have the Gwich'in language nest, and then we have Alaska Poor People's Campaign. And we'll make sure that there's question and answer after each of them share, so you'll get a chance to connect with them. But thank you so much, and I'll hand it off to Jessica. Koyana. Good morning, I guess good afternoon. It's hard to tell with the light, but thank you, Akpik, for introducing us and sharing about Native movement. And I also share in the honor of um, being part of this team, it is really an honor to learn from the leadership and values of the team at Native Movement and SCAC Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition wouldn't be a coalition if it weren't for members of Native Movement staff, um, particularly the long reigning board member, not long reigning, <laughs> long active board member, Princess Johnson, um, and also Ine Begay, um, who's the executive director, as both of those um, lovely humans were founders with myself and others on this call um, in form formulating the Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition. So not only does Native Movement support us in this um, administrative way, but they also support, um, have been formidable in grounding FCAC and the values that we um, aim to live through and live by. So. Um, I am Jessica Gerard. I use they or she pronouns, and I'm on living on the lands of the Lower Tanana Dene peoples. I am originally from Wampanoag territories, um, now known as Massachusetts, and I honor the lands from both of those areas as a way that has informed and tended me. Um, but I just wanted to take this time to share about FCAC and how we organize. And a lot of this comes from, as I said, the value shared with us from leaders throughout Native movement. So we are a coalition, volunteer-led coalition that aims to um, enact climate justice policies, um, campaigns, leadership, um, preparedness as we move through the climate crisis um, in this climate ep epoch. So we have five working groups. We have a regenerative economies working group that is Margie part, is part of. We um, have a renewable energy working group where I see a number of members such as Kathy Walling and Mike Music and Martha Reynolds who are part of that working group. We have um, a interfaith organizing which is currently building a proposal with native movement um, to connect the Western and indigenous values of spirituality and earth stewardship. We also have a policy and politics working group and a keep it in the ground working group. And these five working groups are intersected under the idea and the framework of a just transition. And each of them engages, as I said, with volunteer leadership that moves us from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy. And as Akpik mentioned, this is part of a regenerative economy, right? Collectively fundraising, sharing our resources with one another, sharing our membership, our visions with one another. And while we focus on the climate justice lens of this movement, in the framework of just transition, we fully understand that climate justice doesn't exist without language revitalization. It doesn't uh, exist without addressing the root causes of poverty or conservation of subsistence resources like the other organizations really focus in on that I'll be passing off to. And so this is really important to us because with working in the just transition framework, we know that our lane, our path is to focus on climate justice while being arm in arm with folks that do the other work. And so being that we are um, like mostly staffed by white folks, not all white folks in our membership is predominantly um, white folks. We also take this space and recognize the resources and privileges that come with that. And being part of this community is really a place to share so that we can learn from one another, share our resources together and build this collective movement. 
So I, I just wanted to share that volunteer led group here in Fairbanks working towards climate justice. You can find out more about us at fairbanksclimateaction.org and Margie sharing a little screen about um, us and you can find us on, um, on Facebook and see some of our things of our working groups and all of that. But this is really um, a celebration of the resistance that is required in this moment of climate action, um, just transition, and that all of our rivers and movements are combined into this larger movement. Um, so I just, I don't wanna take any more time. I'm here for questions if you have some and really just, I'm so honored and excited to be sharing this light in this moment with you. Um, excuse me. Um, sorry, I got here late. Could you sum up like really briefly, like what we, what we said? Sure. Would you like a sum of native movement or just FCAC? Just to like, what's what, you, like what started what you've said. So FCAC is the Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition, and we are a volunteer group that is fiscally sponsored by Native Movement here in Fairbanks that works towards um, moving through an extractive economy into a regenerative economy through climate action is my elevator pitch. Um, and that's what we're up to. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Sorry, I don't want to take up too much time, but so thanks. No, thanks for joining us. No, oh, thanks. And Akpik, I don't know if I'm passing to you to moderate questions or what's yeah, happening. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I was like, totally fine. Thanks, Leo. <laughs> we have a little bit of time built in after each um, of the fiscal sponsor group share. So if you have questions um, about their work or ways you can be involved, um, we do have a little bit of time after each one to, to answer questions. So feel free to go off mute or raise your little virtual hand <laughs> and we'll make sure that you can um, get your questions answered. And thank you, Margie, for putting the website in the chat. Uh, what what is Santa Claus here for, by the way? So is is the North Pole? It's because the North Pole is being threatened, climate change and all that. North Pole is being threatened by climate change, but I'm here because I believe, and I'd like children to realize that the greatest gift we can give is love. Aww. Thanks, Santa Claus. Thank you for being here, everyone. Spirit of giving, very appropriate. Thank you, Santa Claus. <laughs> Are there other questions or folks have questions for Jessica? Again, feel free to check out the website in the chat. I'm just pausing because I can't see everyone at the same time. <laughs> Also, if you all are on Facebook and you have questions, feel free to throw them on there and we'll also try to get to you there. Otherwise, I think the next speaker, I wanna um, invite Matt Jackson kind of to our pin spotlight here, who's going to share about the herring protectors. We can, there you Gosh, are. Geez. Thank you, Akpik. Um, I am here to fill, uh, as her daughter Dion would say, the very big moccasins of uh, Louise Casashaw Brady, who is, uh, I would say, the leader of the Herring Protectors Movement. She wasn't available today, um, but she did give permission uh, for me to share a short video from a film that she co-produced um, on the Herring issue. And uh, I think the only thing that I'll say to add to the film is that, um, the words earlier about reciprocity really struck a chord with me. And I think that's so important. Uh, the Herring Protectors are all about uh, reestablishing reciprocity between our community and also between uh, our community and the Herring. And uh, the Krinket tradition of Kuit is a, a powerful ceremony to establish that reciprocity. And the, the film you're about to see will explain that better than I ever could. So. We can share a screen now. Whoever's hitting play on that, thank you. Thank you. 
Yaat Bune, respect for all things. Ceremony as sovereignty. The concept I think is really different from the Western culture. We don't have title to the land. We have stories related to Shitka as Kiksadi. The reason that we had the herring ceremony is that we, as Tlingit people, solidify our relationships to the land, to the waters, to history, and to each other. Within all of these stories lies our original instructions that we've been taught. We are saying, you know, this is our story. It is a celebration and a mourning at the same time, and to allow us to have a space to come together to hurt about it is really, really important. And then also to network together to see what else it is uh, that we can do. It's where we make peace and we invite the guests. It's like the notary public. It's like if anybody questions what our relationship is, everybody there was a witness to say, yes, the Kiksadi, the Herring Rock belongs to the Kiksadi, we were there. We have a spiritual connection to all of these things and it's all of our responsibility to take care of everything that you see in the Tongass. It's this very meaningful traditional ceremony, but for me personally, it was a way to understand my neighbors. It was a way to understand more about the Tlingit people and my own role as a white person and my own role in relationship to the herring. So it was a really beautiful gift to be welcomed into the ceremony and it meant a lot to me personally and I think that that experience was felt by a lot of people in this community who really got to experience the richness of coming together in ceremony to honor at the natural world on which we all depend. Our culture is older than the Roman Empire. We're older than pyramids by thousands of years. It's not just a saying that we are stewards of this land. It's real. It's what we've been doing. And there are systems in place that we utilize to make sure that we got to continue to live here as well as the herring, as well as the salmon, as well as the seals, as well, you know, everything's connected. The sacro herring fishery as it currently exists is really unsustainable and it is really out of balance when we talk about the health of our ecosystem, the health of all of our fisheries, health of subsistence, the health of our local cultures. And I think extractive industries like this that don't respond to community priorities and the voice of the people, they're an example of colonization and it goes back to racism and whose voices are heard at the table when we decide how we take care of the world around us. With everything that's going on in the world right now, that we all can make a decision to pull away in fear and despair, or to come together in hope, and to really start listening to each other. And over the last few years, that's what we've been trying to do. And we need to put aside our differences, be able to be strong allies with each other. It doesn't matter if you're Alaska Native, it doesn't matter if you're non-Native, young or old, whether we've been here for, you know, 10,000 years or time immemorial or came here a year ago. If you understand the importance of herring, everybody's invited to support the Pacific herring in Sitka Sound in Shitka. That's ceremony, that's sovereignty. Thank you for sharing that. That was a beautiful video and it was so wonderfully done. I feel like we, I personally learned so much about the herring protectors and I'm so proud that Native Movement is able to provide fiscal sponsorship. And we do have a couple minutes and um, I do believe that Matt is available for questions. If anyone does have any, you're welcome to either take yourself off mute 
or raise your virtual hand or use one of the reactions. Uh, if anyone does have questions, you can flip through the gallery. Um, if you'd also learned, like to learn more in the Alaska Humanities Forum, most recent issue, the Herring Protectors was just highlighted in a really beautiful um, spread. And I'll put that in the chat. The, website there. The Humanities Forum magazine is publicly accessible, as well as if you'd like to order print. It's also um, beautiful. And Louise is on the cover. And so it's um, just a really beautiful highlight of the amazing work that is happening in restoring uh, relationship and ceremony to the animal kin, kin that uh, Alaska Natives have been in relationship with since time immemorial. And are wanting to recreate and sustain the reciprocity in that relationship. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that Alaska Humanities Forum article. I'll respond to the question in the chat. Um, really quickly, uh, there is a type of seining that happens to the herring. And this is explained in one of the earlier chapters of the film, but I had to choose one to share for this time. And I, I really wanted to center the ceremony and reciprocity. Um, but, uh, you know, I think everyone in Alaska, we, we know that we're pro fishermen and pro salmon, but we also know that there can be kinds of fishing that are harmful. And um, this sacro seining scoops up all of the herring right before they spawn. They actually do test sets and wait until almost the moment before they're going to spawn so that the female row is at its ripest. And the right before they spawn, the row is at about 10% of the mass of the, the biomass. And that 10% of the row is extracted and sold to um, mostly Japanese markets as like a high-end delicacy. The Japanese get their herring row from Sika Sound because they fished out their own populations in the 70s. And uh, unlike salmon, herring can spawn over and over and over again. Herring used to last they used to be able to live more than 20 years. We know this from uh, otoliths in midden piles. Uh, these days in Sika Sound, their average age is like five to eight years because they have so much fishing pressure. And uh, that seining uh, that only uses 10%, the rest is ground up into fish meal for fertilizer, maybe even to farm salmon farms elsewhere in the world. It's just very wasteful. And uh, the Hinket and people all up and down the coast have harvested herring eggs on branches in a way that is not extractive, but actually regenerative for millennia, for thousands of years. And you can lay herring branches in the water, the herring spawn on them, and then they continue living and come back and spawn year after year. And I was told by, uh, I only learned to harvest eggs in the last couple of years, but I was told by someone whose family has been harvesting eggs for thousands and thousands of years that when they would set uh, 10 branches, they would only pull nine and leave an extra branch in the water for the herring eggs to hatch. And so it was truly a reciprocal relationship of giving and also receiving. And the, the sacro sand fishery really disrupts that. And it, uh, it plucks out the oldest, ripest females and slaughters them and wastes them and disrespects them right before the subsistence harvest is supposed to happen. And uh, not only is it harming people who rely on herring eggs for their culture and their way of life, but it's also uh, disrupting the balance of other living things that rely on herring like salmon and, and killer whales, orcas. Thank you, Matt. There's another question in the chat from Kathy um, about accessing that. Maybe you could share. Uh, yes, this is an easy short one. This film is, is fairly new and it's still what they call embargoed for film festivals. And we're really honored. Uh, we won the best the film won the best uh, social justice film at the Red Nation Film Festival in LA just about two weeks ago. And we can't share it publicly until we're done with film festival season, but that's nearly over. And when it is, you'll hear all about it if you follow us on Facebook or Instagram, because we'll be happy to share it as soon as we can. Oh my gosh, congratulations. How amazing. I mean, this is exactly, I mean, what good work that we want to uplift and share about. And I can't wait to share that out um, once that's available. And it looks like people are also eager to 
to be involved and to follow and get to know the work that you all are doing. Um, one of the things that I put in the chat as well is that Louise Brady is on our advisory board and she's an amazing advisor. She's very committed. Um, and one of the things for you all joining, you know, as donors, as funders, as community members, that this is really an investment in indigenous leadership. We have um, a legal board who's indigenous and Alaska native. Um, and our entire advisory board is Alaska Native leadership. Um, in addition to our director's team are all Alaska Native um, Indigenous women as well. So I just wanted to share that as I thought about Louise and her leadership and everything that she gives to Native movement, that your donations today are truly investments to and directly to Indigenous leadership who are doing community-based work. Um, so yeah, just really appreciate everyone again joining on during your lunch hour today. Um, and if there aren't any other questions for Matt and the Herring Protectors, again, thanks Matt for joining uh, while Louise was, was unavailable. We appreciate you being here. Let me just scroll real quick. Um, we have Yvonne Peter here for our next group who wanted to share about the Gwich'in Language Nest. I'm so excited to hear more about this work. And I know Yvonne could actually talk about language all day. <laughs> and we're so grateful that you're, you're doing this. I'm excited to hear you share with our community and hear what you've been up to. So I'll pass it off to you. Um, so like Nay, Jutun Gwinzi, Shojri, Ivan Peter Oji, Vashain Oats Anisha Gat, Tanan Gwich E, Tanan Chadok or Chet Gwalf in and Drink drink with Iguanch Adi and check a qual air Gwinsol Gihi Geh An. I um, wanted to say good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yvonne Peter. I um, work at Tanan Chato. It's interesting to have it referred to as the Gwich'in language nest. <laughs> I guess that's the English name for it, but um, Tanan is the Gwich'in word for Fairbanks, and Chato is the Gwich'in word for nest. So it's the Fairbanks Nest, and um, it and it it is a, a home for language revitalization to support language revitalization through producing new speakers of the Gwich'in language. Um, I know we might have some people listening that might not be familiar um, with the diversity of Alaska Native languages, but there's over 20 distinct language Alaska Native languages across the state, and and we're, they're not mutually intelligible, meaning, you know, I can go down river a few villages from uh, my village on, on, well, from my village, once I get down to the Yukon, I can go down river and um, get to the a Danaka speaking community or a Koyagon speaking community and not be able to have a conversation between each other, even if we're both um, fully proficient speakers of our own languages. And so um, within Alaska, there's, there's about 20 plus distinct languages and all of them are endangered. And so we're really at a critical moment in time where we really need to be making significant investments and in time, energy and resources and prioritizing our languages because of the wealth of knowledge, cultural practices, ceremonies, stories and worldview um, that lies within our languages. I, I really believe that our, our languages are a central peace to our forward movement in, in healing within our families and communities and state, um, as well as building towards a sustainable path. Because as one of our previous, as several of our previous speakers have mentioned, um, that indigenous knowledge and practices of how we steward and relate to the land and each other um, embedded in, within our languages, really deep knowledge and understanding about that. I think that's so important for us to continue to continue forward. Of those 20 indigenous languages, 11 of them, 11 of them are Dene languages, or otherwise commonly known as Athabascan languages. And Gwich'in, which is our language, is one of those languages um, in, in the interior. And in March, March 15th of this year, um, Hilda Johnson, who's our lead teacher and a first language speaker, um, and myself, as well as an advisory board made up of a few of our elders and language um, warriors, Mary Fields, from uh, Gwichaja, Hishin Light Peter from Gwichaja, and Vashrin Ko, and Sam Alexander from uh, Gwichaja joined as our advisory council to help us launch a, a language nest. And a language nest is a space where, in our case, for 32 hours a week, 
basically eight hours a day, four days a week. We brought in um, at, at the start four babies, basically between one and a half and two and a half years old. And the Gwich'in language is the only language being spoken to them in that space. And we're about eight months in now. And I'm happy to report that um, the kids are very much comprehending Gwich'in. Um, only two of them are really being vocal at all um, much yet um, as others just aren't speaking any language for that matter. And, but also those of us who are second language learners like myself and other interns that we've been able to bring into the space are also um, rapidly increasing towards proficiency in the language. And our effort is a grassroots effort. Um, we're really grateful to our elders like Florence Newman and Chimble Gilbert who have been guiding us in documenting and ensuring that we're speaking um, accurately within our language to, to the young kids and to all of those who have helped support us to get to this point um, in, in our work. Our, our kind of a small piece summary, our vision moving forward is really to continue to um, slowly um, grow and increase as we learn more about how to be doing what we're doing because it's so new to have a space like this. Um, for um, certainly for one of our interior Dene languages and um, hopefully be able to share and support with other indigenous peoples who may also be interested in doing something similar for their languages as well. So, and we're really grateful to Native Movement for the fiscal sponsorship, so we could put most of our time into these babies and language documentation and language work that we're doing. Masicho da takenjit. Marika, oh my goodness. I just got really excited and kind of emotional all over again, just hearing about your work. Um, I'm, I love all of the ways that Native Movement and our orgs such as Tanan Chato, I wanted to make sure I got that correct this time. Um, you know, are raising up movement babies. That's so exciting. And I love that all of these orgs are thinking forward to all of those generations ahead. And again, with donations and the support that we receive from um, all of these grassroots foundations and um, community members like you all, this is what you're supporting. You're supporting our kids. You're supporting our future generations. Um, language work is incredibly intensive and it's very healing and I just really uplift the work that you're doing Yvonne and thank you for sharing about it. There's a couple things in the chat I could read here for you. Um, one question from Leo is can you understand some parts of related languages? So um, the Diné language family I'm kind of shifting away from using the word Athabascan because it's not doesn't come within our language family, but the Diné language family has 47 plus languages that are distinct languages that spread from Alaska through Canada all the way down to the Navajo and the Apache nations that border Mexico. And um, there are some words in our languages that are what's called cognate. So we can understand the word like is a pretty cognate word. It means fire. And that's pretty similar among our languages. Um, some, some other words are cognate, but for the most part, even here in Alaska, if I was to listen to a, a Denaka speaker speaking the Khoi you know, language or um, a Denaina speaker, um, I would not be able to understand barely anything that they're saying. But every once in a while, there might be one word that I have a sense that I think I might know what it means, but I'd have to check with them to make sure it was accurate. So, so no, our languages are not, uh, we are not able to understand each other. Although I will say that we do have recordings of some elders from like the 60s one who was speaking in the Danaka language, he switched up to the upper Tanana language, then he switched up to the upper Kuskokwim language, and he, he demonstrated proficiency in about four different Dene languages. So, you know, clearly like other places in Europe, for example, our people were multilingual and spoke many of the neighboring languages to their own communities. And so that, you know, is an aspirational goal for some of us. Awesome. Yeah, there's some thank yous in the chat going on. And I guess just um, because I know a little bit about what you do and we've talked about your work, um, you have a, a really diverse background. You worked at the university, of course, lots of people know that you have a experience in tribal government, but do you mind sharing personally why you've decided to shift and dedicate so much time and energy into this school and why that's important to you? Because I think it's, it's very inspiring. Um, well, first I want to say Hilda, who's our lead teacher, would be here with me today, but she had something come up with her family and so she couldn't be here. Um, we really think it's important to share the space um, and be able to share the story of the Chato from all those who are really committed. Um, but both Hilda and I chose to leave our former positions and dedicate to our language and to um, uplifting it 
um, last year, we just both felt that it was we were at a critical point where we have um, a remaining set of elders. Most of them, our first language speakers are 60 plus years old now. Um, both her and I are just slightly below that in age and just felt that um, it was it was it was the moment that we needed to take action and we can no longer just speak about um, the importance of our languages. We had to take action and demonstrate through practice and also learn. So both of us knew going into this that this is a new thing for us to be in a classroom eight hours a day where we can only speak which into each other. And even her as a first language speaker and me as a you know intermediate student of the language, um, really, we had to do so much learning in those first six months so we could carry on just some of the basic conversations with each other and, and learn language that hadn't been spoken to kids in over 50 or 60 years, because that was the last generation of elders who were raised as children in fully in the, you know, solely Gwich'in speaking household. And so um, we really had to pull up a lot of language and, and, and learn new language and ways of saying things. So, um, but yeah, the inspiration really was that um, we didn't want to become elders someday and have our limited capacity and only be able to speak to about five of the others in Gwich'in that we, we felt like now is the time that we really need to plant these seeds so that perhaps our children or grandchildren's generation can be raised in education systems that are taught through our languages and that uplift our, our knowledge and ways of life that we, we feel are healthier way of life, more balanced, less stress better in alignment in good relation with the land and nature and each other. And, and really that's like a piece of the long-term philosophy and thinking that's grounded in our, our worldview, our way of life. Koyana, lucky kiddo, so much love being poured into the future generations um, through the work like what you're doing in other groups. So thank you so much. Um, and I see some more, you know, lots of gratitude being sent your way. Um, I want to make sure we have time for Alaska Poor People's Campaign. So thank you so much, Yvonne. I'm going to invite Justina and Bessie on to quote the main screen <laughs> um, to share about Alaska Poor People's Campaign. And they've been such amazing partners. I'm excited to hear from you all. So welcome and thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Alpik. Um, Hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Justina. Um, I'm a co-director for the Alaska Poor People's Campaign along with my partner, Bessie Odom. Um, super excited to be here today and, uh, and even more grateful to be physically sponsored by Native Movement. Um, we've been physically sponsored by them since, since the last year. So we're still uh, <laughs> in that startup phase with Native Movement, but um, I personally got my start um, or introduced to Native Movement in 2016 when I uh, came here from Texas and learned everything about, you know, community organizing and movement building um, as I was transitioning from corporate to um, organizing and service. Um, and so I'm uh, really grateful to see this come full circle. Um, you know, I learned from the best with FCAC and then Native Movement. So this is um, amazing. Um, so a little bit about Poor People's Campaign. We got started in, well, in 1968, um, Dr. Martin Luther King started the Poor People's Campaign and it was revived in 2018 uh, by William Barber. Um, and so did the Alaska chapter in 2018 um, here in Anchorage on Denima lands. Um, and so our goals are to shift the narrative and build power among poor and moral leaders. Uh, and to impact elections and policies around systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, and the war economy. Um, both myself and Bessie have a background in um, service and uh, social work. And so uh, for, for us, um, being a front-facing organization, our frontline organization is, is very personal. Uh, working with folks who are extremely vulnerable, facing housing insecurity, facing food insecurity, um, and spending you know, years doing this. Um, it's important to not only, um, you know, support them with policy initiatives and, um, you know, advocacy, but also to support them um, in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and we do that in a number of ways. So, so for us, being a frontline organization, um, 
it's, it's a lot of sacrifice. Uh, we are in the trenches with them. Um, you know, the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, we practice uh, something similar to community engaged design, which we're planning on uh, really focusing on that in 2022. Um, but we really want to deepen the leadership of folks who are experiencing um, poverty and systemic racism. Uh, and we've done that in a number of ways. Uh, so right now with AIR, our Advocates and Residents Program, um, we have served about 22 youth who are experiencing or who were experiencing homelessness or transitioning out of incarceration. Um, and we've given them uh, opportunities to develop their leadership skills. Um, we've given them opportunities to go to Washington and speak with Senator Murkowski, opportunities to be equity designers, um, uh, lots of trainings. But then we also uh, give them a place to rest uh, and make sure that all of their needs are met. Um, we've done this, you know, when we supported a, a houseless camp of 55 individuals. It's, you know, supporting them in their daily needs, but while also listening to them and giving their, giving them platforms to share their story. We're really good about listening and just leveraging our skills to, um, you know, just elevate their stories. And that is what we want to do. Um, that's really important. Um, and the work that we do, uh, that it's not our voices, um, but it's their voices. Um, and I don't wanna take up too much time because I know Bessie wants to talk about the civic engagement and policy piece in our work in 2022. So I will transfer this over to Bessie. Thanks, Justina. Um, thanks to everyone on the call for allowing us to share space with you all here today. Um, and thank you most importantly for continuing to uh, support um, the mission and the goals of our organization, um, not just here in Alaska, but certainly uh, nationwide as well as we continue to build uh, long lasting rel relationships with organizations here uh, in Alaska as well as uh, nationwide. And so we're very, very thankful for that uh, continued sponsorship and relationship with Native Movement and uh, the folks on the call here today. Um, as mentioned before, uh, my name is Bessie Odom. I am co-director of the Alaska Poor People's Campaign, along with Justina, uh, based here in Anchorage, certainly serving um, the entirety of the state of Alaska. Um, and a lot of the things that Justina mentioned are things that I wanted to elevate as well, uh, specifically around community engagement and building community. Um, but even more than that, here recently, of course, we've been dealing with this pandemic. Uh, and I think the pandemic has did a wonderful job. And what a lot of us have been realizing is that uh, the pandemic has further exposed the vulnerabilities uh, that have been uh, spoken about and experienced by marginalized communities um, all across the United States uh, and certainly abroad as well. Um, and so for us as an organization and working with marginalized communities and underserved communities, we recognize uh, a, a greater need to get out there, do the work and get into the community. A lot of organizations kind of have this top down approach. Uh, we as a Poor People's Campaign uh, from the inception of the campaign uh, strongly believe and continue to believe that uh, to make real change, we must work with folks uh, at the ground level, at the base level, if you will, and build up capacity, build up the movement. And so we've been doing a lot of that, uh, specifically with young folks, as Justina was mentioning earlier, uh, but certainly with policy as well, uh, as we uh, continue to work um, in increasing voter turnout and participation. We recognize that it's not enough to tell people to get out to the polls without addressing some of the underlying issues around maybe transportation, uh, um, uh, issues around uh, children and daycare uh, and work. A lot of people can't get to the polls if they're working multiple jobs and can't find the time to get off. And so uh, Poor People's Campaign has previously in the past addressed these issues. We will continue to address these issues by uh, providing rides to the polls, um, helping to pay for postage uh, when and where we can, uh, providing information uh, in multiple languages, uh, having interpreters uh, for folks, uh, but also uh, even more than that, you know, taking the time to educate folks 
about the issues, not in a way that is biased, but in a way that is neutral to let folks know what the issues are, where the candidates stand, so that not only are they showing up to the poll on polling days, um, but they are um, showing up informed and confident in their decisions when marking that ballot. And so uh, that's a lot of what we do when it comes to the policy. But um, in addition to that, we're also looking at uh, bills passed at uh, the local level as well as the state level. Uh, and analyzing those uh, pieces of legislation to ensure um, or to analyze, further analyze their impact on marginalized communities. Uh, and so we've been uh, addressing some of those issues and looking into those as well. Um, and uh, lastly, I would say um, that we, again, are very, very thankful to a native movement for their continued relationship and their trust in the work that we're doing and their confidence in the work that we're doing. Uh, we know that our relationship with you all is very new, but we're very confident uh, that we will continue to go far. And we uh, can say that uh, by um, acknowledging that you all have helped us tremendously in more ways than one. Uh, and for that, we're extremely grateful. And again, thank you for allowing us to share this space with you all today. Uh, and we look forward to the further engagement. Awesome. Thank you so much, Justina and Bessie. And yeah, I think, you know, I'm so glad that you're here and able to share because I think your org and all of the work you're doing is an excellent example of how we we support grassroots organization and especially new organizations who are starting off. Um, so I'm really glad that you're able to share here today. I love the, the mentorship and the AIR program that you all have been doing and also the mutual aid networks. I know you don't have a whole lot more time, but you all have been doing really amazing work that, as you mentioned, has been so important. And we've all realized that, especially in the times of pandemic. Um, so thank you so much for all the work you do. You all can check out the website also in the chat. Um, you can look more into their mutual aid networks and the youth mentorship that they shared about. Um, but I want to pause for a second, see if there's questions uh, for Justina and Bessie. If you want to put it in the chat or if you raise your your virtual hand, I think I'll be able to see it too. Um, but while we do that, uh, be sure if you'd like to make a donation, you can check out our website or check out any of the, the links that we've dropped to make the donations. Thank you, Margie. Margie put it in the chat. Um, so again, Giving Tuesday, and we're so grateful to have this time together and to really practice our values of reciprocity. Um, you know, I think it's also important to acknowledge the mindset of abundance. You know, so many of us from our communities and our experiences um, have come from a place of survival and we're shifting with grassroots support from people like you to a mindset of abundance where we can um, really thrive and live our lives of um, health and abundance and thriving with our community, with those movement babies. Um, and in light and in warmth. And so we really appreciate you tending the light with us today. And again, thank you, Inrag, for sharing the Kulik with us. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Margie for our last very end of our, our call today. But thank you so much for, again, your time and your donations and all of the love and support that you all give us in our communities. This is what really makes it possible. Uh, so Koyana, and I'll hand it to Margie. Thank you so much. Um, it is so joyful to be here um, with you all. And I hope that um, that all the participants who are watching real time and watching the recording and watching on Facebook feel part of something bigger than ourselves. And um, as a donor, I really um, appreciate being able to give in community and be part of um, a collaborative collective process. And so we invite you all to join us in that practice right now. You can donate to Native Movement. I get to make the fundraising pitch right now, which is sometimes really hard, but it's just, it feels very easeful to me right now because the work speaks for itself. There is a shared vision and it is so deeply um, moving to me to be part of supporting and investing in this work and guided by the leadership of the folks that you've just heard from. And so um, this is a little bit unconventional. We're asking 
you to give one donation to support all these orgs. And that's something that might um, be a little bit confusing, but it is really living into that practice of um, the expertise that Native Movement has in terms of reallocating, uh, regranting, and supporting and nurturing and really incubating um, Alaskan movements. And so we invite you to um, donate um, at that link that I already dropped, nativemovement.org slash donate. And um, our goal um, is to raise $100,000 by the end of this year to support the amazing work that you just heard about. And so we um, want to also offer the, the framing around the importance of giving at all scales. And I think that this is also where that um, opportunity to give as part of something larger, giving in community together, we can do really big things, um, really um, speaks to me because um, it's, it's more important how many people give than how many dollars each person gives. And to be able to um, uplift that, I wanted to invite people to um, direct message me if you are um, in a place where you would like to make a pledge today or your real time going online and submitting your credit card info or your tangibly your old school like me, you're writing a check, whatever it is. Um, if you wanna do that with us in these closing moments um, to not feel lonely as we give, but to be um, giving together. So direct message me um, how much you're giving and I will um, add those up here real time for those who want to stay on. Um, but I also wanted to say that we um, are very grateful um, to some of the um, pledges that we have been made already and um, some of the funds that have already been donated um, through the emails and outreach that we've been doing around this event. Um, so we are, um, I think I need a drum roll here um, because together um, all of those grassroots and major donors gifts come to $63,000 towards our $100,000 goal. And so I am seeing in my chat, donations are coming in. Thank you. This is really fun. This is a party. This is a fundraising celebration. Um, and so please go ahead and um, yeah, send me, send me if you have um, the interest of making a multi-year commitment. That's something else that we'll be talking more about during a um, donor community building training series that I also want to make sure and share all that info for. So I'm going to just paste in the chat the invitation to join us um, to, to really share some of the best practices in um, social justice giving and build community amongst donors. So this is a um, four part series um, that will be running um, in the new year. So mid January um, to March 1st. And uh, we really wanna be in community and partnership. And so um, making a multi-year pledge to Native Movement also helps um, be in it for the long haul and support this work in a way that is ongoing. And so um, you can be part of building out what it looks like to be in partnership and community with us. And um, there's all sorts of things. I know that we're at time. So I'm gonna um, just say that all of these organizations are working towards a shared vision and um, that we're very grateful to be in community. And for those who want to stay on, I'll just catch my breath here and do some quick math and share some of the info that's coming in um, my chat here. Thank you, Margie, for announcing that, our progress. And thank you all for participating in this call. I hope that you enjoyed this lunch hour with us and learning about the ways that Native Movement is just really proud to be um, a source of sharing in reciprocity in, in ensuring that the funds that community members like yourself are entrusting with us, that we're passing it along in the spirit of abundance and the spirit of giving and being in good relationship with um, our community members across the state and the ways in which um, you know, our movements are multifaceted, they're complex, just like our lives. And by giving to Native Movement, you are supporting uh, language revitalization, climate justice, um, good relationship with 
our um, animal kin and ensuring subsistence practices and really just recreating this world that we we want to be living in and giving us all a sense of hope and um, light and just this shared collective vision. So I appreciate everyone all everyone for joining and for giving and I hope you all have a very wonderful day and thank you again. <laughs> And just today we've raised $1,220. Thank you so much, everyone. The, the um, more than more than six people have messaged me. I lost count. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you all so much. Hope you all have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.